August webinar is incredibly timely, titled How Much is Enough? Lessons Learned on Mental Health from Elite Athletes. I am Dr. Rosie Bowder. I am the treasurer and serve on the board of directors for United Suicide Survivors International. United Suicide Survivors is a global international organization that really elevates the lived expertise of those affected by suicide as thought or attempt survivors, as well as those who are bereaved by suicide or lost survivors. We do this so that we can um, empower those with lived experience to become change agents by telling their stories so that we can create change. The reason we have um, our four incredible panelists tonight is because of the depth and the breadth of their lived experience when it comes to sports and performance. As Rick mentioned, this is going to be recorded. We're live on Facebook, and we will leave questions for the end. All of you will uh, be muted throughout the webinar as well so that we can hear from our panelists. I'm going to sh stop sharing my screen, and what I'd like to do is um, begin by having our panelists introduce themselves, and I'll go in, in alphabetical order. So I'd like to start by introducing Tish Garen. Good evening. My name is Tish Guerin. I am a licensed psychotherapist specializing in sports performance, um, primarily working with elite athletes as well as couples. I love doing couples work. Um, I'm a Charlotte native. Um, my specialties include, um, again, working with elite athletes as well as uh, couples, individual counseling to include uh, those that have depression, PTSD, uh, as well as I am also certified as a QPR instructor. So since we're talking about suicide, so I am a QPR instructor and I do that uh, across the city here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and I'm getting some out of state requests as well um, to provide QPR, which is question, persuade and refer um, for those that may be, them, for those that have attempted suicide or maybe thinking of, of attempting suicide, um, to arm people on how to prepare and support others who have suicidal thoughts, as well as I am a certified mental, uh, I'm sorry, a certified mindfulness clinician, and that is new for me. So I specialize in mindfulness training for athletes and all of my clients. Uh, utilizing specific um, apps such as like Insight Timer or Headspace or Calm um, and working through mindfulness techniques for better concentration and focus. And I'm so happy to be here. Thank you guys so much for having me. We are also happy, Tish. Next up, we have Jay Harrison. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me. I'm Jay. Uh, I come to the panel. I'm a former professional athlete. I played professional hockey in the NHL for 12 years and abroad for a few more. Um, I transitioned out of sport. Um, I'm now currently like Trish, uh, a licensed psychotherapist in the beautiful state of North Carolina as well. Uh, I work primarily with professional athletes across mental health, transition and well-being context, but also performances. This conversation will no doubt take us. A lot of those things bleed into each other quite regularly, uh, but primarily emphasize around the transition piece and how athletes negotiate their identity uh, better understanding and recreating that identity to find value and purpose and meaning uh, and dealing with some of the uh, leftovers, if you will, from a commitment to a very long demanding career at an elite level. Uh, still learning every day, uh, which is what I love about this particular role and coming to speak with you and share some of my insights and experiences. Hopefully you will find them meaningful. Thank you so much, Jay. We have already certainly in our chat before we started Next, we have Breezy Johnson. Hi, I'm Breezy Johnson. I don't have a lot of cool degrees like these guys do, but um, I am an Olympic alpine ski racer. I um, learned to ski when I was very young, grew up in the sport, um, made the US ski team when I was 18, um, and qualified for my first Olympic games in 2018. Shortly after 2018, I crashed and tore my ACL, which is where a lot of my um, mental health um, story begins after kind of battling through some depression and um, issues. After my ACL, I came back only to um, hurt my other knee in 2019. Um, and I'm now on the mend and hoping to compete in the Olympics this winter. 
And I better see all of our attendees cheering her on virtually. I've got your names now from the registration. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Pete. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for the invitation. I'm Dr. William Parm, uh, serving in a number of roles. First as a professor in the School of Education at Loyola Marymount University. I am trained as a psychologist, licensed and board certified uh, and licensed in California. I'm also serving as the director of the mental health and wellness uh, program for the National Basketball Players Association, a role that began in 2018. Uh, and related serve as a member of the mental health and wealth, mental health and wellness task force to the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee. So thank you for the invitation and look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Parham. We'll start with our first question, which is, if you can tell the story of how you um, entered into the world of elite sports, where did that begin? And feel free to chime in if anyone would like to begin and, and responding to that question. I'll, I'll start off. Um, so I originally was working with elite athletes in my private practice here in Charlotte, North Carolina, and that was going well. And I had really just been doing the work uh, and primarily working in hospitals, so working on psychiatric units. So that gave me a breadth of knowledge um, that I just did, wouldn't get elsewhere. So being able to see really um, acute disorders up close and personal and being able to see what I see in the DSM or what I read in the DSM and actually see it in person uh, is completely different. Um, it's a, it was an experience that I, I really would have taken for free. Um, then I was reached out um, or contacted by uh, a contact at um, the NFL League office who said that the Carolina Panthers were looking for uh, a clinician, which was something that was very new in the NFL. There were clinicians that uh, work with all teams. However, there wasn't a clinician that was full-time in-house, which is what I was asked to do. So when I went into the Carolina Panthers, I was the first, at least what was reported, I was the first full-time in-house clinician in the NFL. And during that time, I built programs, which is what uh, I consider my specialty, is building mental health programs for athletes. That included everything from clinical assessments to outpatient therapy, to family therapy, to group work, to uh, presentations around health and wellness. Uh, I served as a director for player wellness with the Carolina Panthers for about a year and a half. Um, and that was something that was very big and still a proponent uh, of Coach Ron Rivera who brought me in. Um, so he was a, propo a proponent of, of mental health and advocacy of mental health and wellness. So um, I was very blessed and lucky to be there um, and to be able to serve in that way. And currently I work with uh, Toyota Racing Development, which is under the NASCAR umbrella. And I work with their drivers um, in their driver development program and creating mental health and wellness programs specifically for them that are tailored for them that includes everything from assessments to personality traits to um, how they can be better and as well as utilize, utilization of mindfulness techniques. So if anyone kind of follows me on social media, they'll see that um, is a big part of what I do and just what I enjoy. And I think overall, just my experience in working um, with athletes for the last few years has just been incredibly rewarding. Um, it's always great when you know you can go to work and you can wear a pair of J's and some sweats and everyone's okay with it because they're really there for the knowledge. They're really there for the experience. And so it's been incredibly rewarding for me. And I just love being in the space and just hope to continue to build programs wherever I go. And I'll pass it on to who's next. <laughs> I guess I'll jump in. I've uh, been doing actually this work since probably the early 80s. Uh, when I got out of school, I was first uh, working at UCLA. And at the time, I was the sole psychologist working with the athletic department. Somebody brought to my attention years later that I was the only African-American psychologist at the time delivering services to the UCLA community. I was working in the clinic at the time. Uh, I've always been enamored with sport, uh, mostly with the mastery and the genius that I've seen expressed in both men and women 
across sports doing things that are just miraculous. You, you can't even put words to them. And for some reason, that always caught my attention. Uh, what also caught my attention uh, in certain sports, particularly football, basketball, there are a lot of African-Americans yet there were no African-American clinicians. So part of my drive and positioning was really make sure that there, there was a voice and that there was another dimension to understanding the psychology of that journey. Um, <clears throat> working at UCLA, I had worked with, uh, seriously by the time I left 25 years later, uh, since the every sport uh, there was consulting with them and still to this day consult with a couple of the teams. <clears throat> it as so happened, uh, UCLA at the time was one of the two or three universities producing a lot of players for the NFL. Uh, received a call from an NFL player, former uh, Bruin, who said, well, Dr. P used to talk about X, Y, and Z for us. Why don't you come here and do that for the NFL? So actually, I was a, uh, a psychologist, consultant psychologist for the NFL in the early 80s for about six or seven years. Uh, did a lot with their rookie transition program specifically. Uh, so many there in the NBA uh, saw I was with the NFL, so they asked me to do something in the NBA. So I started doing some consulting with the NBA as a league office. I was doing a presentation for some of the staff and one person in the audience was a person who worked with the Lakers. He says, well, Dr. P, you live in Los Angeles. Why don't you come work with us? I was in college for the Lakers for 10 years. Uh, in between that at UCLA, I was also working with a number of teams and was uh, asked to participate as a psychologist for the US Olympics of 1996 in Atlanta. Uh, so some of this is just being sort of at the right place at the right time. Uh, but as a result of my work, um, both collegiately, professionally, Subsequently, having worked with USA Tennis, USA Soccer, Major League Baseball, I've also done some writing in the area. Um, again, one thing led to another. Uh, at the time, I was appointed in my particular position with uh, the NBPA Players Association. I had been consulting with the NBA and the Players Association for many years. And uh, <clears throat> in fact, just came back from Las Vegas at the rookie transition program for the league, as well as the uh, summer games. And I've been doing that probably for 12 or 15 years. So I really have enjoyed all of that. But in my experience, it's just sort of being in position, um, really loving what I do, taking what I do very, very seriously. And when we put our program together, I think it shows uh, multiple dimensions. Uh, and, but part of my agenda has always been starting the conversation. I, I think athletes and athlete systems participate in keeping athletes trapped from the expressing their humanness. And so a mantra we've developed in our program is the person before the performer. And it really is important for me to begin the conversation and to add wherever I can. That if you were looking at athletes perform at Hall of Fame gold medal levels of accomplishment, carrying around what we know is sizable baggage, emotional struggles, that we could get a place for them to rest, to talk about, to begin healing, and literally dump some of that stuff that they've been carrying around. My belief is that we would see an exponential increase in the expression of the individual talent and contribution to the team. So my goal is to really reframe the conversation and to say that what we have seen is not yet the GOAT in any sport uh, who's been released from shackling from the issues that they occur. So that continues to be my driving passion to invite people to consider that when you in fact invite athletes to be human and talk about their stuff, you are not opening up Pandora's box of compliments. You're actually opening up a treasure chest of yet to be tapped talent and genius in the expression of their athletic. That's an excellent theme to carry through Dr. P, the, the person and the performer. 
and our, our two panelists with lived experience in being elite athletes, let's hear from you a little bit of what led you on the path. Sure. Um, yeah, my, my love of the game started very young. As soon as I could get vertical, I was on skates. Um, you know, uh, fast forward, um, excelling at the sport, you know, growing quickly is the only thing you wanted to be coming from, you know, small town Canada, uh, being a professional hockey player is equivalent to being royalty, or at least one step below. Uh, so uh, certainly a, a worthwhile venture and well supported by everyone um, in your community and family, something as a dreaming big, but a dream worth pursuing. Uh, I was fortunate enough at a young age to, to have some ability in the game. I was able to uh, to represent my country three times before I was 20 at the national level and got to as well after I turned professional. Uh, I, I say incredibly fortunate enough to have gotten to play a game for a career uh, and be a professional athlete uh, and experience what it's like to actually live the job of sports, which I think is a very unique aspect of the athlete experience that doesn't get a ton of attention. Um, but certainly living those both the amazing highs and, and the amazing lows. Uh, of a professional athletic career and, and all that comes with it. Um, I recognized in my career that uh, I wasn't invincible. That happened quite quickly. The trajectory to the top, uh, that you, how you planned it would be and, and making your way up to professional ranks is no easy thing. Uh, and obviously the path was a little bit more crooked than I may have anticipated. Um, but, but with that, I uh, was faced with a, a great deal of, of those challenges and the emotional strains that come with that and persevering uh, to achieve those goals. And in retrospect, I look back at my career and, and one of the most important things that ultimately led me on this path as I, I transitioned into working with athletes from a mental health and performance perspective is I started to see myself as something other than an athlete. Uh, someone reflected back to me in passing that, you know, you would be a great such and such <laughs> uh, was the comment. And I started to see it was like a spark was lit in me and that this isn't just me. And I'm not tied to the wins and losses and, and hockey plus minus goals, assists, win, you know, whatever, whatever metrics you're using in your sport. And I started to see a new world, a new world that I could actually contribute to. And uh, my vehicle as an athlete was education. I got an enormous benefit uh, and accrued so much capital by throwing myself into my education and, and found that the more energy I spent outside the rink, it actually gave me more power. It gave me a greater ability to actually play. It's a sport. It's a game. You have to play. You can't play tight. Uh, you can't play tense. You, you have to play loose and you have to have fun. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a child's game played by, you know, adults. And it, <laughs> it goes by kids' rules at times. And you have to accept those. Uh, so I, I found that a lot of uh, messages is getting in professional sports, you know, people being mindful, don't take your, uh, your stress home with you, don't leave everything at the rink, leave everything at the gym, the field, whatever it might be. I started to flip the script a little bit. And so what am I taking with me to the rink to, to support my performance? You know, what, what am I feeling good about? So when I come back tomorrow, I'm in the right frame of mind. And education was that vehicle for me. And I was fortunate enough to play the game. And I feel that was a pivotal moment in my experience that allowed me to play for a long time. Uh, it, it actually put me into a level of performance that even I didn't think I was able to achieve, uh, even representing uh, Canada at the world championship level in 2013, uh, which uh, I hold in, in very high regard as a, a very significant accomplishment. Um, and so I, I started to move towards this and my education was always focused on understanding people, learning more about why, uh, which can be a good question, sometimes a bad question <laughs> or the right, right question, sometimes the wrong question rather. Uh, and uh, it led me to uh, undergraduate in psychology. I ended up finishing my career with a master's in clinical psych, uh, where I completed my residency in my first year of transition, uh, emphasizing in, uh, PTSD and outpatient in sexually assault, assaulted uh, female victims. Uh, so since then, uh, I've been using this opportunity to retool uh, and repurpose my life and understand what gives it meaning. And part of that is very much like, like Dr. Parham said, is reframing the conversation. Uh, I, I really felt I was capable of, of providing something for athletes that that was unique and I wanted to be able to overcome the very first defense mechanism every athlete throws at you when they tell you that you don't get it and that one doesn't work with me it doesn't fly because I've been there I've climbed through the minors I've, I've seen it all I've, I've experienced it all I've, I've cried laughed and everything in between if we can get by that defense mechanism and give you an opportunity to be you and express whatever it is uh, that you're going through in that moment, just to be witnessed. 
is an incredibly powerful moment. And it's very empowering for the athletes to embrace their true power, to overcome. Uh, you know, all of those great things that we use sport as that vehicle for mastery. Sometimes we need some soft space. Athletes are so focused on working out. Sometimes we need to work in. Uh, and I hope to provide that for my clients and the athletes and others that I work with as well as an opportunity to work inward uh, and use that time uh, to better connect with yourself and the why and recognize our divine potential and actualize it and through sport and beyond, especially. Awesome. Thank you, Jay. I'm breezy. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, I grew up ski racing. I, um, like Jay, was lucky enough to have some talent, which you need in any sport. Um, I gave up a long time ago on the idea that if you just work hard, um, success will be given to you. And, you know, I qualified for the team in 2018. I fought through um, some emotionally abusive situations with problematic coaches that we had on the team at the time. And, um, you know, made it through that and qualified for the games in 2018. And then, um, you know, had my struggles with, anxiety and depression through um, my injury and have since um, begun working, you know, both in panels like this, as well as internally within the US ski team to better situations for athletes. I work as um, an athlete liaison. Um, we don't have team captains, but it's a similar role in which we bring um, issues forward to the team and advocate for change within the US ski team. Um, and I've been, you know, working on that for, um, I believe this is my third year now since the program began. And um, that's been, you know, hugely um, important. And I think, you know, that, um, you know, I've been lucky to be, I think, on a, a cusp that maybe has been, um, you know, only just starting to develop in the last few years in which, athletes do get to, you know, put forward voice and um, advocate for themselves. You know, I think when I joined the team, there was still, a, you know, a feeling of kind of shut up and ski. Um, I forgot to mention this, but great book by EDTs. Um, it's a fictional book, but with real stories about um, her journey to the 1988 Olympics. Um, but, you know, that has changed to definitely, you know, work with, um, you know, I think maybe Bill Parman has been um, part of this that, you know, a whole athlete is not just a, you know, happier person, but actually a more successful athlete. And that has been a very, um, you know, interesting way that has been sweeping um, athletics and has been um, something that I've been fortunate enough to be a part of as we begin to, you know, bring change from the inside out and from the top down, uh, bottom up um, into the sport. And so, yeah, I guess that's the long and the short of my experience um, in alpine ski racing. I had to put in the chat that when you said qualifying for the games, you meant the Olympic games. So I, I want to flip the question back and breezy, perhaps you can, you can start. Um, and, and then Jay about being elite athletes. And there's so much that we're not seeing as viewers, as those who enjoy watching elite performers, we are only seeing one slice of of your lives and who you are. There is so much else going on, especially the challenges, the obstacles, like you said, Breezy, of abusive, uh, emotionally abusive environments and situations. What are other things that um, we might not see as viewers that are challenges, especially when it comes to mental health for elite athletes? Well, I think that there's, you know, a lot for one, I think one of the things that, you know, coming out of this Olympics that I think is um, not well shown is that in 
in team sports, there is one team that wins and one team that loses. Um, but in individual sports, which is the majority of Olympic sports, um, you know, there's, you know, there's often, you know, one win winner and 80 losers. And there is a very broad spectrum that particularly in this country, we don't notice or care about um, because, you know, we want to see the, you know, the fairy tale ending and we don't necessarily want to see, you know, the, the beginning of the journey or the, you know, the Cinderella story where, you know, she goes home and, you know, never finds, you know, Prince Charming, like it's never saved, just doesn't win, you know, people who just, you know, don't reach the top of that podium. And I think one of the things that's lost is, you know, I think a lot of what has driven me for a long time and what I think, you know, we need to advocate for, for a lot of athletes and in watching athletics is, um, you know, the courage to pursue something where so many people fail genuinely. I mean, you have one person who wins the, you know, 200 meter hurdles or a hundred meter hurdles, and you have thousands, perhaps millions of children who tried, who never reached that point to honestly, like commit yourself to doing something with that high of a rate of failure to really pursue it with your whole heart is I think a win in and of itself. And that's something that we often, I think, lose sight of, but I'm, you know, I'm curious, Jay, what also you have to say. Yeah, that's a, it's a really great perspective. Uh, I totally agree. Uh, some, one that I, I would like to share uh, coming from um, the career side. Uh, remember that fight you had with your spouse or partner last night? Well, the professional athlete had that fight too. And remember the call you got from your, your kid's teacher because they were doing such and such in class. A professional athlete got that too. Um, and they also had to play that night. Um, and they went on the road for, for two weeks prior to that. Um, and on and on and on it goes. And I'm kind of getting towards, uh, you know, the day-to-day -day demands that, that are placed on these individuals and the commitments and the balancing act that needs to occur uh, in many ways across a balancing uh, that commitment to sport, understanding what needs to be done to be performing at your peak. But as uh, we, we mature and go into adulthood, you know, there's, there's more commitments, there's more things to commit to and explore. Uh, so uh, just recognizing the demands that athletes are under uh, across, not just when they're performing, but all over the place. I mean, for, for athletes like Breezy, it's not just when she's at the slope and when she's at the gym, it's when she's at the grocery store, I'm assuming, of course, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's when she's at the grocery store, when she's at an event, there's a charity event, what she's doing tonight, it's, you know, 8.30 on the East Coast and she's being an elite athlete right now. Um, so sometimes where the athlete ends, and the person begins can be can be very uh, tricky to, to discern. And there can be some pile up, uh, especially in, in the lives of athletes and the demands. Uh, one of the ones that's certainly coming up uh, for, for me more frequently with professional athletes is the loneliness and isolation that creates. Always being turned on, especially in public places, I never really get to be myself. Uh, I don't really know who that is anymore, um, whether I'm you know representing my, my club or, or, or a cause that is very important to me. Um, I'm still always acting as though I'm supposed to be. And sometimes that can be very difficult uh, for athletes to manage when they just want to be left alone. Um, and not every uh, athlete gets that opportunity. So, you know, I certainly think some of the, the stresses are is there's, there's no work-life balance when you're committed to achieving something that's never been done before. Uh, it's something we walk into eyes wide open, but also recognize it, it is a weight and a burden to bear. Uh, and we have to be respectful and mindful of that when, when an athlete slips uh, and maybe temporarily loses their ability to, to cope effectively in a moment, especially with the outlets we have these days to uh, express ourselves. So, um, you know, being mindful of those demands that the athletes are under on a day-to-day -day basis and that pursuit and that courage it takes to take that on amongst just, just being in the world we live in today is, is something special, special and to be revered. And, 
Uh, just taking a moment to pause and be empathic of that as well, I think is important. Yeah, Dr. P. Tish, any related thoughts? Well, I, I would just add one. I, I'm going to take some liberties here with uh, hopefully understanding, but I, I really want our audience to hear what Jay and Breezy have shared. I, I won't go into detail, but a lot of what they said uh, were emotional traumas, things they don't talk about. Many athletes have them and experience them. You witnessed that in the recent Olympics. You, in the last probably five to seven years, you've seen more athletes come to the recognition that I'm willing to hoop and play ball and do whatever I have to do. But I'm tired of being invisible. Jay used that word in his discussion and that's a very clear feeling that goes on. Like, who am I? because you're being pulled in so many directions on top of trying to master your own stuff. That's a, a real tough burden. And, and he talks about balance. There is no such thing as balance for elite athletes. It's one-sided. The balance comes from everybody else understanding and supporting their journey. They really sometimes don't have the, I, the uh, opportunity to really balance themselves until they finish. <clears throat> and depending on how that occurs, you know, if it's a forced retirement or forced out by injury, that's a whole different psychology of adjustment than if you just plan for it and everything's fine. I, I will add some of the things that, that, that don't get mentioned, but for me and my experience in working with athletes is nonetheless true. Uh, when I look at the larger sociopolitical climate, when I look at race, for example, race, culture, ethnicity, sexual orientation, disability, faith-based practices, and other markers of personal identity. All of that, singularly and collectively, are always present as part of who that person is. Mind you, it may not ever be the focus of the conversation, but that doesn't mean those factors and forces aren't present. So that being said, if the desired goal is to really understand and appreciate the whole person then those identity markers come into play very significantly. Not only do those identity markers come into play, but the histories that frame them become critical contextual parameters that need to be understood. I will bring up things like racism, sexism, ableism, homophobia, they provide that added context. So arguably, when you also have had the context of this worldwide pandemic, and there are two going on. One is the COVID-19, the other is racism. You see an increased social protest. And what are they protesting against now? The same thing they were at back in the 60s, systemic injustice and equities. Now, there are many folks who say, nah, athletes just need to shut up and dribble or shut up and swim or ski or whatever. And there are many who will go to their grave really believe in that too. Those are folks who I consider want to erase history and deny the humanness of the athletes who are performing right before you and providing you a portal to lose yourself in, to relive your own experiences that they never had themselves. Athletes are human beings. And when you see the social political unrests, I can begin to tell you the, the tensions uh, African-American athletes have felt looking at the lynching by knee, of George Floyd, looking at the subsequent social unrest and the killing of black men. That's a psychology that's powerful. Asian hate that had a resurrection. That's not new. A lot of people think it just occurred. That stuff's been going on a long time. And those are the psychologies people don't talk about. We talk about, and again, uh, Breezy was courageous enough to bring out um, abusive coaching systems. I want our audience to understand that's not unique. One of the things we saw in the greatest of all times performance of Simone Biles 
that she is the one sole survivor of the abuse by USA Gymnastics. Understand just the psychology of abuse, let alone being African-American, let alone being a woman, let alone being a teenager. Never telling anybody yet performing at GOAT level abilities. So I, I guess I want to add what a lot of people don't see in the audience uh, and read about in papers and books. Athletes care around a layer of invisibility and they don't have the same permissions to be vulnerable and to talk about their stuff. And they buy into that to some degree. But if, 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 if I look at famous study, and I'll say this is the last contextual parameter, that came out in the late 1990s called the ACE study, Adverse Childhood Experience, big major study that had close to 17,000 patients. And there's a combination with the Center for Disease Control and Kaiser Permanente Medical Establishment. But essentially it's a huge case study. One of the things they discovered was that there's a direct link between later adult physical health and the adverse childhood experiences one has had as a child. A key finding is everybody on this screen and in this listening and viewing audience, if you were to go right now into your phone, mobile phone Rolodex, not Rolodex, I'm dating myself, directory, and randomly close your eyes and pick 100 people, of your people in your, in your directory, 65 out of 100 of those people would have had the one to four adverse childhood experiences the earliest of which not uncommon they would have experienced before the age of 10. Yet we are incentivized as both men and women in society to incentivize to not say anything, to not talk about that, don't care the family and women. And wanting to be dutiful citizens, which can lead to athletes. We translate that confusion, that disarray, that, that emotional fragmentation into what we call the edge or the dog or that fight. And athletes convert that into the chip on the shoulder. They really distinguish themselves. Ultimately being quite successful, creating the illusion that, you know, they're making a million dollars wide, they really have to worry. They're carrying around what I've labeled as invisible tattoos of trauma. And there are many other people besides athletes carrying around in the viewing audience. And they don't really want to hear the real story of those athletes, because then that would trigger their real story that they work hard to not talk. Thank you so much, Dr. P. Yeah. Fish, what do you have to add? Oh my, you guys have touched on so many things so eloquently. Uh, the last thing I, I think I will add is highlighting what Jay and Dr. P have already kind of spoken about. And that's really just a compartmentalization and asking athletes to, and expecting athletes to compartmentalize. You can't separate the athlete from the person or um, the performer rather, right? They're one in the same. I think that's the biggest shift that I think we're seeing right now today is athletes that are stepping forward and saying, hey, I have this going on and I need to take a step back from this or I cannot perform at the level that um, I'm expected to work or that is my best because I have this going on psychologically or being okay with saying, you know what, today I just need to take a mental health break. And we're seeing this across mm -hmm. even large corporations where people aren't just calling in sick and saying, I've got a cough or I've got the flu or even I've got COVID symptoms. What we're seeing now is people saying, hey, I need a mental health day and they're calling it a mental health day. And we're seeing organizations um, as well as coaches and um, teams that are saying, okay, I get it. Coming from the NFL, that's one of the things that we had to highlight is like, hey, he just had a death in the family of someone very close. He's not making it to practice, nor should he be expected to make it to practice. He needs some time to process everything that just happened. He needs time to process the news that he just heard while he was on the field. Asking someone to continue to perform and excel in spite of the trauma um, or the re-trauma that they are 
going through is almost inhumane. So I think continuing to push this conversation forward and normalize the topic of mental health and mental illness is something that's very re real. You know, we all have it. Um, and I think that making sure that we are all a part of the conversation and more so a part of the solution that destigmatizes having mental illness or destigmatizing destigmatizes working on your mental health is of the utmost importance. Um, I'm just a firm believer, and I've been saying this in any platform that I get the opportunity to speak on, is that we have got to put mental health at the same tier as we do our medical health. If you have a broken ankle or a broken finger or a sprain, you're going to immediately go to the emergency room. You're going to go and get that x-ray, right? You're going to make sure that you get that healed. But how often do we take a step back to say, you know what? I need to go and speak to somebody about what's going on in my head. I need to speak to somebody about why I always shiver every time someone brushes up against me, right? These are the things that we're not necessarily putting at the forefront because it hasn't been given, mental health has not been given the same um, support as medical health has. And that's what we have to change. That's why it was so refreshing, but unfortunate to see Simone Biles, to see Naomi Osaka, you know, being black women number one, and then to see them be the goat of their respective sport and still say, I need to take a step back. That was pivotal. And I mean, just as a, from a psychotherapeutic standpoint, I got chills when I saw, I was like, I can't believe they did it. They're doing it. Like the change is here, the change is now. And it's really up to all of us to continue to embrace and push this conversation forward. And it is so powerful, right? It's the normalization of sharing and prioritizing those boundaries for your health. And I'm so glad you said that, Tish, about mental health being on the same tier as physical health, because it is, we, as I, I don't know if we talked about it as we started or beforehand, but the expectation that athletes are invincible is not realistic. And it's something that we need to, as viewers, as people who appreciate and benefit from watching athletes, these, these athletes perform, we need to recognize, hold ourselves accountable and reflect on that, that absolutely unrealistic expectation. I, well, the other thing I'd like to add to that, if I may, to what Tish said, but I think it's sure. very, very important. A lot of folks view mental health and wellness sort of on a dichotomous scale. You either have it or you don't. You're depressed or you're not. You're anxious or you're not. I believe that that's an inaccurate way of looking at it. We'd like to actually see mental health and wellness on a continuum. There are those in the eight, nine, and 10. We're feeling pretty healthy, pretty composed, pretty balanced across domains of their life, family, careers, finances, et cetera. And they feel like they have a number of options for the ability to create. Then we have the four to six range. You're basically doing pretty well in a lot of areas of life, but there may be one or two areas that they're having to put a little bit more energy in because they're having some challenges. They're fighting through it, but it nonetheless was late. Then there's the one to three people who are struggling mightily with purpose and meaning of what do I do and who am I, am I relevant? So we need to begin to first see them on continuum. But once you get on that continuum, the other thing that you said, I think is very, very important and I, I use the analogy of a hand. If the audience were to spread out their fingers, if somebody grabbed one of them, they could snap it and break it like that. But when I look at this and I try to remind athletes, one of the fingers is your physical health. Another is your nutritional health regimen. The other is your restorative health regimen, sleep, rest. The other is learning the playbook and going to practice. But the fifth should be your mental health and wellness. When you have that covering your other fingers, one, you develop a fist that nobody can break any of the fingers. And two, you have the power and energy to push through that which you need to push. So it should not be an appendage as part and parcel who you are as a human being and acknowledging where you are in that continuum and getting resources to support your growth and movement and maintenance, even if you're up to eight to 10. The way life happens, you are not guaranteed to stay there. So how do you put 
systems in place, buffers in place, protective factors in place. But hold on to that. For those who are struggling more mildly, how do you get them to discover the genius that they innately have, that somehow they feel they have lost their way? Lost their way? How do you really get to them to get them functioning differently? <laughs> So those are two important points I just wanted to highlight. And I can't believe it. We're, we've got about 10 minutes left. I often say with our webinars, I wish we had just so much more time. And I'd like each of you, with, in about two minutes, if you can, share the unique role you view that you have in sustaining this change, initiating change, and um, maybe the ways in which that makes you hopeful for the future when it comes to recognizing the unique challenges, especially around mental health for elite athletes. Yeah, I mean, I think that for myself personally, I think that we are at a point of change in mental health. We're seeing that, although I still think that just as we have in the past, just as, you know, with, um, you know, racial injustice and things, we always think that we're a lot farther along on that spectrum than we are. And that's important to always remember that if we think that we're halfway there, we like just got out of the gate. And so, you know, that's a really important thing to remember that, you know, we are getting this ball rolling, but we do have a long way to go. And I think that, you know, being being in the sport, I think, you know, the change, you know, does need to come from, you know, within with the support of, you know, people like Dr. P and, and Tish and, you know, that sort of thing is very important. I think the other like thing that I would like to just add at the end too, is that, you know, just as Dr. P says that, you know, mental health is a spectrum. I think trauma is also a spectrum. And that has been one of the things that has been really hard is that, you know, people look at, you know, for example, in gymnastics, the Larry Nassar scandal, and it's like, that's like, you know, a 12 out of 10. But just because you experienced, you know, emotional abuse that didn't involve physical, it didn't involve sexual, doesn't mean that it wasn't abuse that just because something isn't criminal doesn't mean it's not abuse. You know, we have a tendency to say, here's the worst thing. And that's the definition of this thing and nothing else can come close. Like it doesn't count. And that's, I think, one of the things that we need to get through. And one of the things that I've been advocating for change on is um, to understand that spectrum of trauma and that spectrum of, of issues and that, you know, we can fix things even though it's not a 12 out of 10 problem. Yeah, that's such a great point. Thank you, Breezy. Uh, super excited. There's, there's no, uh, you know, better time to, to be involved in this particular work. Uh, super excited. I'll be out there in the trenches. Um, so I, I kind of like to see it. I, I decided to get into this work to take the hard calls. Um, so I, I look forward to continue to do that both from a clinical side and then also from a research perspective in shaping, you know, what athletes understand. Ultimately, my goal is to debunk the myth that if I'm not all in, I'm out for athletes, which is far too often the mindset that they bring to their sport and that any deviation from the sole goal of being the greatest possible athlete they can be is somehow uh, an admission of failure, of uh, hedging your bets. Uh, the research is coming out that says that's flat out wrong. Uh, and in fact, it, it could be um, in, in, incredibly wrong. It's actually detrimental, that mindset. So the more we can do to uh, increase our uh, athletes to accrue resources, to see their value, uh, to see their agency and their efficacy across a whole bunch of aspects of their life to which sport is one vehicle that they can activate their fullest potential. Uh, I'm excited to, to walk that path and, um, and do any part in that I can. But I also want to add to that, I what uh, both Breezy and Jerry are saying, it, it's, I, I want to be real clear. I, I'm not interested in the athletes trying to solve it themselves and putting an additional burden on them to do what they got to do. See, I can't understand Jay or Breezy or anybody's journey as a superior athlete 
but I don't understand the system within which they are operating. I've gone on record as saying professional athlete systems across sports, they really haven't failed at addressing the mental health and wellness of their athletes. They have succeeded at not addressing it. They don't want to talk about it. And we have to understand what are the systemic influences that allow athletes to feel embarrassed, shamed for speaking truth because the abuses that we are talking about and I, I, I can't thank Breezy enough for saying what she said. These abuses about which she speak are systemic and they don't always have to be criminal. They, criminal. they nonetheless leave those indelible marks. But the last thing I'll say is something I invite all of my students to memorize. And I first let them know that the goal of memorizing isn't to recall, to regurgitate, or to remember. The goal of memorizing is to forget. Forget means to get so deep ingrained you don't think about it. And I have to focus on two things. One, a person will never see their reflection in running water. It is only when the water is still will their reflected image begin to emerge. And once they are still, I invite them to really listen to what their body is telling. The body keeps the score. And when they listen, and the best way to listen is to take the word listen, those six letters, move those letters around, reposition them, and you come up with the word silent. So the best way to be silent, to, to listen, is to be silent. The truth and the answers that you need about how to distinguish yourself as an athlete, how to position yourself in the world, lies in here, not out there. And uh, I, I guess I'll end with, I just want to continue to one, keep the conversation going because it's so important. And Breezy, you had a, an amazing point with, it seems like we've just gotten to a, a, a beginning point where athletes are speaking up more publicly, but there's still so much further to go, just as Dr. P has highlighted in terms of changing the systems. And these systems are incredibly hard to penetrate. It's incredibly hard to change systemic mental health stigma. Like it is, it's not easy. I, I want to continue to be in a space where athletes can be vulnerable. And I think that's the biggest thing that I've kind of taken away in, in working with athletes up until this point. I remember when I first got with my NFL team, I wasn't sure exactly how it was going to be perceived to be perfectly honest. And for a couple of days, people really didn't know how to take me, you know? Uh, now, mind you, I was going in there originally and I had, you know, the suit on and I was like, maybe they think I'm getting ready to diagnose them or something. And I don't want that to be the perception. So I changed up the image. And even then it was still a little hesitant. Uh, but then I, I quickly realized that one, most of them, um, meaning the NFL is 67.8% African-American. So most of them were just happy to see someone that looked like them that they may be able to relate to because they didn't really have it. So it provided them a safe space to be vulnerable. And I think that's what athletes for the most part will need in order to destigmatize mental health and mental illness. It's a place where they can be vulnerable. Now, when they were on the field and they were talking to me when they were one way, when they got in my office and that door closed, I got a completely different person. I got a person that was really able to exhale. And because they were able to do that, because they were able to let their guard down and speak their truth unapologetically without feeling like they were going to be stigmatized or shamed, it showed in their performance on the field. Because now they're even at work, they can bring them whole, their whole selves. And that's something that we really have to continue to push forward in all systems of athletics is for athletes to be able to bring their entire selves to work. The same thing that we ask in major corporations like Amazon, and, and you see it now do um, through like DNI, um, through diversity and inclusion initiatives, like we want you to bring your whole self to work. Well, do you? Do you want me to bring my anxiety? Do you want me to be, bring my trauma? Do you want me to be able to bring these things in here and still work effectively? I think that can wholeheartedly happen, but we've got to change those systems and we have to be proactive about doing so. 
I have so much gratitude in my heart for each of you, Tish, Jay, Breezy, Dr. P, for for sharing this conviction that you you each have in walking the walk and talking the talk and supporting the mental health of of these athletes and increasing the transparency of all of the challenges that they face. I want to uh, stop there and share that we will have our next webinar on September 7th. It's going to be at, uh, I'm sorry, at uh, bright and early at 10 a.m. Pacific time, 12 noon Eastern time with Dr. Rory O'Connor. Uh, he'll be speaking about his new book, When It's Darkest, Why People Die by Suicide and What We Can Do to Prevent It. I want to thank Rick and Jessica Lewis for working behind the scenes to engage our attendees and to be sure that Facebook Live is running smoothly. Please follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Unite Survivors. You can check out the recording on our YouTube channel as well as our website at unitesurvivors.org. I'm going to do another thank you. To Breezy, Tish, Dr. P, and Jay for your honesty and your vulnerability and sharing your experience so that it can benefit athletes, elite athletes moving forward. Thank you.